interviews from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe Watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange There were no fighter jets Did someone give the order Not to intercept And if they really scrambled Then why'd they fly so slow Maybe there's an answer That we don't want to know Where was our president, George W., that fool? He was visiting with children at an elementary school. And when he heard the news, he didn't seem concerned. He just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned. The Bushes and Bin Ladens Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded They flew his family out Osama got his training From the CIA Our soldiers took Afghanistan They let him slip away A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? Get your views from television news. You'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. Howdy, and welcome to another episode of Omega Presents. Well, I spent a lot of time this week watching C-SPAN, and I don't know about you folks, you guys ought to be getting mighty pissed. I am very upset. Continually, I see co some decent congressmen trying to interview the wrongdoers and the, the greedy people and the people who lie and whatnot. Well, we were having in Congress, they were trying to get down to how are we going to have oversight on this so-called bailout. Uh, 
it just pisses me off to watch a congressman try over and over and over again to get a question answered. And they wouldn't answer the question, no matter what, how the question was phrased. So we see this continual game of some sort of attempt at oversight, according to the Constitution, and continual uh, obfuscation of the, of the law. And nobody does anything about it. And I, for one, am furious. How much are we going to take of this? It's, and the bailout is nothing more. What it is is exactly like this. People have gotten themselves completely addicted like any junkie, like the worst junkie you ever saw, only they're not injecting heroin or cocaine. They're injecting money into their bank accounts. Those rich blankety blanks are stealing everything that isn't tied down, and they've got that all now, so they're trying to steal the rest of it that is tied down, like your homes, like your bank accounts, like your retirement. And what are we doing about it? Absolutely nothing. So these junkies that are just hooked on cash to, to the detriment of everything else in the world, they're hooked on cash. So what do we do to help them out? Do we send them to rehabilitation? Do we put them in jail like, like we typically do with drug users, which is stupid in this society in the first place? We shouldn't have anybody that uses drugs in jail unless they commit an actual crime. And if you don't want them to commit crimes, take away the artificial high price. Well, that, we're getting off on a different subject. But So what do we do with this money? We give these addicts a ton of cocaine. We give these money addicts billions more and say, that'll help you. You think they're going to get healed by be giving them more what they're addicted to? Are you crazy? Come on. And why does it matter? Why am I talking... I mean, why is this show here? 9-11 was an inside job. Why does, it, why does that matter? Well, I want to roll a, a video. It's Iraqi war protesters, Iraqi veterans, who've come back from the Iraq war, and they say, no more. We're not going to go back. They lied to us to get us there. They told us it was about Saddam. They told us it was about Iraq, but it wasn't. They lied to our soldiers to get them to go kill people. So as soon as they start rolling that video, we'll switch to it, and I'll keep talking until then. Uh, number five is the one I want to play in there. And uh, I got a challenge for you folks. Pay close attention to this video, and if you can watch it without crying, it, oh, somewhere through it. January 04 to July 04. But I'll start it off with um, my progression in Iraq has started with 9-11 because that's what led to the war. Like Dennis was saying, that's what fueled the fire. That's the big part of the lie that led to the lies I witnessed in Iraq. So I didn't join because of 9-11 because to me, growing up as a kid in Kentucky, I was working 50 hours a week. I was selling drugs to, to pay my child support. I was broke. I was a hood rat. And I was growing up like you probably see a bunch of kids running around the ghettos around here. 9-11 happened it didn't affect me. I didn't think about it because I didn't have health care. I was working a job that paid me five dollars something hour. What, what do I care about these 3,000 people that died when my friends are dying every day in the street? I didn't know it would come to affect me one day. But I also knew about the Desert Storm guys who became terrorists. But all of a sudden in Kentucky, because it was some brown people, people in Kentucky were looking at me like I was a terrorist. Because I'm dark, I can grow a beard, you know, and I'm not as white as many as you people in the room. I'm white, but I'm not, like, I'm not that light. So I started to feel a lot of that, like, man, people are, you know, they're worried about, they're going to hit Fort Knox in Kentucky. And I'm thinking, this is, this is racism. This is what feeds the fuel that Iraqis are beneath us, and we can go kill them. Because, look it, they killed 3,000 innocent people. They don't care about innocent lives. In Desert Storm, we couldn't get into Baghdad because the people heard about the innocent people we killed in the bombings. Now, 3,000 Americans are dead. We don't care how many Iraqis you got to kill. Killing the civilians is part of war. And that's what they sent us into Baghdad with. I joined in 03 because I was broke. I needed money. But I was a young American kid. I wanted to fight in the war. I joined up. Month out of training, I arrived in Baghdad, Iraq, January 04. Saddam's been captured, and I get there, and the guys that I'm serving with have been there for six months already. They were there in 03, and I go, well, 
You know, I, I think it's come out that, you know, these people had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no Iraqi on those planes. We can see around here, there's no Al-Qaeda, there's no terrorist syndicates. I joined in 03 because I was broke, I needed money, but I was a young American kid, I wanted to fight in a war. I joined up, month out of training, I arrived in Baghdad, Iraq, January 04. Saddam's been captured. And I get there, and the guys that I'm serving with have been there for six months already. They were there in 03. And I go, well, you know, I, I think it's come out that, you know, these people had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no Iraqi on those planes. We can see around here, there's no Al-Qaeda, there's no terrorist syndicates. And they laughed at me. And I said, well, you know, we're here to help the people. And they laughed at me. And I said, well, what's our mission? What's our goal? I, we, you know, I thought, I thought we were going to find the people that did 9-11. I thought we were going to get these weapons of mass destruction. I thought we were going to help the people. And they are like, all we're trying to do is make it home alive. And then I'm going to lead you in now to the other lies. Because you guys know the lies, but I bled for these lies. I watched my brothers die for these lies. People had lost people in 9-11. One, two, family. I lost many of my friends and brothers. And I lost part of me for the stuff I did in Iraq. And then we go to January, February, March. You know, nothing's happening. And then Bush gives his speech about uh, bring it on. And in April of 04, we lost 135 soldiers for this lie, for his lies, for his swaggers being from Texas or whatever. And the more soldiers we lost, the more our procedures changed. Which leads into escalation. 9-11, we can go kill people now. We lost 135 guys. We can kill people now. We were ordered and fired upon, you know, hunker down, radio, wait for orders to return fire. In April, they told us in a crowded area, if one person shoots at you, kill everybody. Because they're letting you, they're letting them attack you. They are no longer innocent if they're there at the time of the crime. Sounds like American rules. If your buddy commits a crime, you're there, you, you can get caught up on charges on it. But these aren't charges, these are death. We're killing people because they're there when someone else attacked us. Because we believe that if we kill enough innocent people, they'll stop the people from attacking us. But what they don't realize is the innocent people we killed, it was their brother, it was their uncle that was trying to kill us because we already killed his three children. You roll into Baghdad, every single big apartment building is blown up. Every single apartment building in Baghdad has been broken to the ground by artillery and airplanes bombing. You cannot meet someone in Iraq who has not lost a family member. Could you imagine what we had done in America if in 9-11 everybody in America lost a family member? What would we be doing? Would we be talking about war? No, we'd be in the streets with weapons. And so people talk about, oh, these people killing American soldiers in Iraq, they're terrorists. Not terrorists, they're wearing sandals. And they got an AK. And they got 14-year-old boys building bombs to kill these American soldiers because we've killed their family. So, we're done in Baghdad. We killed enough people. I was ordered to kill innocent people. We killed innocent people. When they shot at us, we shot everybody. We were done, you know. Every guy I served was against the war. We believe 9-11 was a lie. This is an 04. Every sort of service believed 9-11 was a lie. We thought the people would expose the lie, know the war's a lie, and bring us home. I got friends that are there in Baghdad in 07 on their third tour, three years in Iraq. And we're talking about it still when people are dying. We go down to Najaf on the way out because we get extended. You did a year, you can't go home yet. You got to go to Najaf. And we shoot hundreds of artillery rounds into downtown Najaf. Areas that we couldn't shoot at before because they were religious places. But just like 9-11, the more soldiers they killed, the more we could do. 
It's all escalation. They've been escalating this war since 1990. And now they're finally, now with this troop surge, they're going to put soldiers on every street like they're cops. Because we've escalated and we've let them do it. We've let them do it because we stood by and we've talked about it. We've got to hit the streets. You've got to stop paying your taxes. You've got to stop feeding this fuel. Because if we believe 9-11 is a lie, then why are you paying your taxes still? Why are we still letting these soldiers die? And me, as now, I won't even talk to politicians about the war. Because there ain't no point in it. Democrat, Republican, they're all profiteers of war. Even lots of anti-war organizations are profiting off my brother's pain. You know, no Iraq veterans are getting paid off this war. No, we're all just sitting in the street homeless. I've helped five AWOL soldiers in the U.S. since I've been back. Well, I spent two years in Canada because I refused to go on my second deployment. I came back, I got kicked out of the military. So that, that was my, that's why I'm here, I'm a resistor. Because we're tired of waiting. We're tired of waiting for the politicians to stop the war. We're not going back for that third tour. I've been helping five AWOL soldiers in the United States, and no one's helping me help them. No anti-war organization, no, no one has helped me help these people. I'm digging money out of my broke pockets to help these people get off the street. And that's why I'm here today is because, you know, if you, if you believe 9-11 is a lie like I do and all these soldiers going AWOL, you got to help the GI resistance because we're going to stop the war. No one else is going to stop. You could have a million protests, talk to a million politicians, expose 9-11, which you got to keep doing. You got to keep exposing 9-11, but that's not going to stop the war. Because everybody in America pretty much knows it. Everyone in the anti-war movement knows it. They won't talk about it because they're scared of the bad publicity that comes with it. But I don't care. I'm a resistor. You know, I don't, the movement wouldn't even touch me because I was AWOL. So I, I'll say how it is. 9-11 was a lie. I know it. We're soldiers. We know it. So now I'm helping GI resistance. And that's what you got to do. You got to focus on 9-11. But like Dennis saying, you got you to gotta keep hurling, pushing stuff. There's 10,000 AWOL soldiers in the U.S. right now. There's a couple hundred in Canada, and they're starving. And we're dying because we believe what you people are telling us. You know, you, you owe it to us to help us. All these Iraq veterans are dying because no one's helping us get with this PTSD. No one's helping the soldiers. No one's supporting us. They just keep sending us back to war. They just keep sending us back to war. What I was saying just as that clip came on is if you can watch what you just saw without bringing a tear up, you know, without having to wipe your eyes, then you're not a human being. You're not, you're a cold hearted son of a bitch. And pardon my language, but did you listen to what that guy said? If you know that 9-11 was a lie, why are you paying your taxes? Why are you cooperating at all? It's just a shame. And people, you want to know why we're talking about 9-11? Because look what they're doing to the world on, based on that. They're using that to manipulate you and me to go gung-ho killing people. That's why we have to stop. That's why I introduced that anti-imperialist league rhetoric last time. And it just infuriates me. Now, last last week, right, or last time after my show, I got to talk to another video producer down here at Portland Community Media. And, you know, we always talk about each other's shows, and he asked me what show I was doing, and I told him that 9-11 was an inside job, and he kind of goes, mm -hmm, you know, one of those guys. And I'm sick of that reaction. How many mind-bent <laughs> people are there? I mean... I, I don't want to call this guy names. I mean, it's not his fault. It's conditioning, deliberate conditioning for years and years and years that we are a great country. We do good and we never do bad. And that is what is ingrained in everybody. We believe it so much in our soul that we will not listen to anybody that says any different. So this guy walks up to me after he finds out I'm, you know, I'm talking about 9-11 being an inside job, that there were demolitions planted in the buildings. And whether or not Arabs actually were involved, they were only involved as a cover for the actual treachery that was done by our people. 
And the problem that we've got is people are in such denial. This guy came up to me. He says, hey, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I agree with the official story. And I'm going, oh, man, this is absolutely nuts. Um, an engineer that agrees with the official story, the only way he could possibly agree with the official story is if it, the only way he could agree is if he didn't examine it at all. And I'll take that call after about five minutes. Just just wait a minute. Um, the he, he started talking about insulation on the steel, and he started talking about you know f fires can weaken steel, and that's what brought about the collapse. He ignored all kinds of key things, like how did random fires spaced at random places through the building cause a perfectly symmetrical collapse? It's not physically possible to do it that way. You can't have a random fire create such a perfect collapse that requires months of, of study by demolition companies. We could, this has been said before, I'm not the originator of this, but we could start our own demolition company. All we'd need to have is a bunch of airplane fuel to splash it around, set it on fire, and the building falls perfectly into its own footprint. No problem. We could, beat the, we could undercut the bid on those real expensive demolition companies. And there are enough people that are hungry for money that if you could do that, they'd be doing that. But it's not possible. Those buildings fell because of explosives. Now there's several key things that is exact evidence that you have to, this engineer says he's a mechanical engineer, so he knows what the ASME is, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and they certified the steel in the Trade Center building to, I, th I think it was 2,000 degrees for over two hours, I've heard as much as six hours, but it's somewhere between two and six hours at 2,000 degrees without failure. That means it doesn't weaken at 900 degrees like has been so commonly splashed around. That's talking about just ordinary steel. We're not talking about this special steel that was UL tested uh, before and after. I think it was before, too. But anyway, UL certified the steel. I've got a little clip that we'll put roll in about that. But this, with that highest standard, 45 minutes of fire caused by jet fuel it, you know, has a possibility of reaching... 1800 degrees at if every condition is very good but as a mechanical engineer um well i i, I guess that would be more of a uh, a mechanical engineer isn't in the, that field where i was going to start talking about the chemistry but uh the collapse so symmetrical requires bringing everything out of the way so everything else can fall. And the speed of the collapse, well, r there are other people that talk about this much better. And I'd, uh, since we have a caller before we run that clip, let's go ahead and take the call if we can. Thank and you, uh, I hear you. Go ahead. What, what do you, you think guys? about what's going on? I'm glad you're doing your show still, man. Good job. Well, thank Even you. Alex, everybody rocks, man. Uh, we got to keep it up. Like that guy said, <clears throat> excuse me, like that guy said on the video, why in the hell are we paying our tax? Why? And he called it. He made a mistake. He says our taxes. It ain't our taxes. <laughs> if it's not a portion, it's not legal. Period. You're absolutely right. If you're if you're a wage earner, you don't have to pay taxes. No, of course not. You only have to pay taxes if you are making a profit, and because off the, of off of some activity like a corporation. Right. Well, they, profit. See, know. labor is is a direct compensation. You work. And you get compensated exactly, even Stephen. So there is no no profit there. You're compensated for your labor. You don't have to pay taxes on that. The only way the Constitution says you have to pay taxes is if it's apportioned. And that means you that means figure, equal to distributed to the right. People. You figure out how much tax you yeah. want to collect, and you divide it by the number of people paying. Boom. And they don't do that. They base it on your income or something else. But either way, that's illegal. And so if you're paying that taxes... That is illegal, and, it's, and, and I don't believe that, uh, you know, I mean, hey, what are we going to do? They're, okay, we quit paying our tax. We, we, they, uh, I made the mistake. Our taxes. Yeah. It's not our taxes. We quit We, we don't pay volunteer. the tax. They require us to, to violate our Fifth Amendment, to file a 
tax form, which <laughs> the the Fifth Amendment set the fourth or fifth I, or both. Well, you know, you're you're off on another subject on taxes that we can fill a yeah, whole thing with that. that I'd that's like to how say, that guy was on the video was talking about yeah, how Aaron Russo. This. You're talking about Aaron Russo, and the the video is freedom to fascism. And well, that's, that too. That's yes. a great one. Ron Paul. I don't know. But right. Ron Paul's on that same subject. Anyway, hey, I've got you. a video that i got to roll in, and so i got to yes. cut you short. Sorry thanks, about that. Thanks, Bill. You bet. And this video that we're going to roll in next um, is Stephen Jones talking about the analysis. Now, one of the things that I was going to talk to this mechanical engineer that he had to explain, I mentioned about the molten metal that was found, and, you know, just like NIST, he kind of said, well, I don't know about molten metal. I don't think that exists. You know, and so, okay, nothing's going to prove to him that there was molten metal there. But uh, Stephen Jones found those microspheres of iron, and the only way they get created is they get have to turn into extremely hot molten metal and then blast out into space so that surface tension can pull them into a perfect sphere, and they have to be high enough up so that they can cool off before they hit the ground so they remain spherical. And the only way that you can do that is with extremely high temperature and blast to get them blasted out, um, which means that it couldn't be the result of an ordinary fire or a gravity collapse. Now, the next thing that you'd say is, well, how do we know that Stephen Jones didn't, you know, manipulate the evidence somehow? Well, the way you know is because the exact same analysis and photographs of those microspheres appear in section or appendix C of the FEMA report. So it's backed up by FEMA, and, uh, and then how do we know that we didn't get high temperatures in the building, high enough to even hurt metal? Well, because NIST did a study of, you know, a paint chip analysis, a very accurate way to determine how hot the metal got, and they determined that it didn't get any hotter than your oven, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that's the official story. I think we should believe that. Now, uh, the analysis showed that the microspheres were not molten steel. Steel, the construction steel, has chromium in it, and there was almost no chromium in the microspheres. However, they did have uh, manganese and sulfur, which happened to have no explanation from any of the building materials that were in the trade centers. Uh, so that sulfur had to come from somewhere else. And it just happens to be a very key ingredient in thermite, which is the military patented version of thermite. Now, thermite is powdered aluminum and powdered iron. And when you add a little sulfur to it, it's like adding salt on ice. It lowers the melting point so that you can really cut. Um, it's a common thing. You can get it over the Internet. Stephen Jones uses it in his physics classes to show exothermic reactions. I think endothermic, exothermic. Well, I'm not the chemist. <laughs> You'll have to get that one right. Uh, we're having technical difficulties with the DVD. Uh, we want to play cut one. Oh, we got another phone call? Well, we'll take the phone call, and when you get that DVD ready, let me know. Hello, caller. Is that me? Uh, we need a little more volume out here. It's me, Bill. Hello. Uh, too much. Yeah, speak up. What's up? Okay, Bill. I got, uh, I've been thinking about this and wondering why people will say, oh, it's a fire and all that crap, and I believe the official story. They got, this, this we were set up for this. <clears throat> well, they yeah. were testing us. These are the same people that watched when that tank went into the building at Waco and started that fire, and then the yeah. official story was they burned themselves <laughs> up. Now, that nobody ever questioned that, and it was on live TV. Well, yeah, lots of people did question it, but it didn't go anywhere officially. No, it didn't it go was anywhere. Official lie, yeah, cover up. Right, right, and that was you know that was Janet Reno. This goes way back. And then, you well, know, you know what bothers me about that a lot was that they violated the Posse Comitatus Act by using a kind of a backdoor approach. You could send in the military only if there was a meth lab or child molestation, of all things. Uh, and so they drew up something and gave it to the governor, Dixie Ray, or whatever her name was. Uh -huh. uh, 
that said there was both a meth lab and child molestation going on there. Oh, so yeah. she sent in the tanks and everything like that. Right. And two weeks before the tragic fire, they found out that it was a lie. Right. right. I mean, right. not that they were mistaken, but that it was a deliberate lie. Right. So right. at but that no point, with, when she didn't recall the troops immediately and put whoever lied in jail, that's when she became complicit. Absolutely. Now, I, I hate these politicians that think that they have to bow down to some sort of monetary bullshit or, or whatever, you know. Well, it's time for them to stand up and start obeying the law, for goodness sakes. Yeah, well, my new sign on the window is, my new sign is, <clears throat> now what? Because all these Obama Kool-Aid drinkers. That yeah, everything's okay oh, now, but Obama's in there, right? Yeah, right. Well, they better pay attention and wake up. <laughs> Because Obama is just going to shift things because he's just, you know, part of the game. Well, they're already talking about making Hillary secretary of state. Oh you God. might as well make us a permanent be, war country at that point. Right, And we're going to move. And then all these, we're going to go to Pakistan. It's really, it's going to get worse. It's time to the, for the Anti-Imperialist League. Uh, you know what? You, your show last week, got, I just loved it. And I really loved when Barry got on and tied that securities, yep. all that information in Building 7, and I have no doubt that Building 7 was supposed to go down, and all that information was to go down to set this up that we're going through right now. Well, remember, they they did this before, and we yeah. all saw it at the Murrow Building in Oklahoma. Oh, that, yeah, that was the next and one. And we have video of them taking extra unexploded ordnance out of that yeah. building. We see the bomb. Yes, the bomb you know, It's ridiculous. We have videos of it, and this they still deny it. And that's when they introduced terrorism. Right. That's and terrorism is what... terrorism was born. It's just like the criminals in the prisons. They're from the drug war. And they aren't criminals. They're people... You know, we don't lock up people who are addicted to cigarettes. Right. We don't lock up people alcohol. who are addicted to alcohol. Right. So right. why do we lock up people who are addicted to anything else? Right. It's right. ridiculous. Right. Yeah, it, there's so much it's, wrong. it's hypocrisy. Americans are making this into a giant state synonymous with hypocrisy. You can't love America the way it is. If you do love America the way it is, you are a blind, brain-dead meadow muffin. Absolutely. Now, you... you you can love what America should be, and that's what I do. And that's why I'm fighting for us to get back to obeying the law. I say we need to make every politician that breaks the law off with their heads. Yeah. I mean, it's time for that again. The French Revolution. And off with their heads, we can do it with the well, law, or we can do it without the law. Either way, do you hear that, FBI? Are you monitoring my... That's television right, right now. So You're going to make me disappear because I'm telling people off with the, your heads for violating the law? Well, you FBI agent that's listening to me right now, or whoever in right. Homeland Security, or whatever you're doing, you listen to this. You know what the law is, and you know that you routinely break it. So, who's the American here? You or me? Right. Who's the patriot? Yeah, I'm the patriot, and you're the crooks, the right. criminals, the cheaters, right. the frauds. Right. Any officer that upholds a lie, upholds an illegal order, ought to be, you know, out of here. Well, yeah, there needs to be a perp walk, and it could go on forever. Exactly. And I watched that whole Winter Soldier hearing, not the thing that you showed. I watched that but I was so impacted. I watched it on a Sunday morning. It was right. on 29. I, I did see Winter oh, Soldier. Oh, my God. Democracy Now! played that a lot. Uh, but hey, anyway. It is, uh, thanks a lot. You're righteously pissed. And you know what? We need to wake up and remember we the people. And we the people yeah. need to take this country back. Now, uh, these Obamites are going to be in for a rude awakening because... He's just part of this whole family. Well, his wife was a member of the Council yeah. on Foreign Relations, no the, the warmongers that start that are controlling all this shit. Yeah, and hey, she's related to We got to go. I, I want them to roll this. Uh, start the okay. video five now. We don't have time for one okay, anymore. Sorry, I'll talk to you later. Oh, that's okay. Good work. Thanks, Jan. All I right. appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Anyway, we're going to play. Our, not five, we'll play six and seven. Now, is that, is that confusing enough for you in the control room? Play six and seven right on through. It'll give us 15 minutes of explanation about the 
the analysis. 40 years ago, the steel used to build the World Trade Center was certified by Underwriters Laboratories, a global product compliance and public safety guardian. Let's hear a lone voice that spoke out from this enormous company. My name is Kevin Ryan, and I'm formerly a manager at Underwriters Laboratories. I was fired from my job five days after sending a letter to a government scientist at the NIST questioning the report that the NIST had recently released in October of 2004. I wrote this letter because I had serious questions about what I saw in the report. Those questions went back to September of 2001 when UL's CEO came to our location in South Bend. He told our entire staff that the World Trade Center steel had been certified by UL and he said that we should be proud of how long the buildings had stood. Over the next two years, I did some research and found some very disturbing facts, including that the steel had been disposed of in an unprecedented manner. Once I discovered those facts, I sent a written question to UL CEO asking him about these things and what he was doing to protect our reputation as a company. He replied in writing to me that UL did, in fact, test the steel. He talked about the quality of the sample and how well it had performed in the tests. And he said that our company had tested the steel and that it had done beautifully. After that, he asked me to be patient and wait for the NIST report because UL was working closely with them. I saw this report in October of 2004, and in November, I sent my letter to NIST asking for clarification. I felt it was an obligation on my part to ask the questions since no one else seemed to care to. After the 1993 bombing, the fireproofing in both buildings was updated considerably. But when you look at the NIST report, you don't see any testing that showed that a 767 would widely dislodge the fireproofing under any impact, let alone so far from the point of impact. So now we've been left with a new theory that is not really a theory at all, but only a collection of vague statements. The NIST report represents what can really only be called anti-science. They started with their conclusions and worked their way back to some leading hypotheses. When the results of the physical tests showed that the temperatures were far too low to soften steel and that the floors could not have collapsed and that the fireproofing could not have been widely dislodged, the NIST ignored these results and built a black box computer model that no one can argue with and that would spit out the right answers. Today, anyone who's conscious enough to know what's happening in the world knows that most government policy is being driven by this false story. Crash down and punish the perpetrators of this attack. This is being seen on Capitol Hill as another Pearl Harbor, as another Pearl Harbor, as another Pearl Harbor. The steel in dragon-like lengths and contortions spoke for itself, bent, deformed, without cracks. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. There's no buckling at all. Here is the meteorite, molten iron fused with concrete. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. It is true that heat expands steel. In a fire, steel members may swell and bend slightly. But this, how could these huge tangles have been created? The steel below the towers had melted at many thousands of degrees. Since metal conducts heat, were these twisted remains formed by high temperatures wicking their way through a gridwork of steel? Explosives also deform steel. As they fire, gas pushes outward. The force of the gas can easily bend a large steel column. Two kinds of debris, huge shattered columns that could break a truck, combined with matter that was near pulverized. You have two 
110 story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. September 11th left over 1,100 bodies unaccounted for. At ground zero, this was found inside a length of steel. And before they sealed this up with the sheetrock and all the building materials on the interior space, the workers would sometimes put beer cans and the newspaper that we found, the New York Times paper, was we found in, in a similar spot to this. Secrets cannot be kept forever. Just as that newspaper from 1969 revealed itself to us decades later, we will someday know the inside of September 11th. The reasons for the staging of such a production go far back into time. Insurance policies covered nearly everything in the World Trade Center that was destroyed. But what if certain commodities could be removed in the nick of time? Gold and silver held by commercial banks and the COMEX exchange is said to have been stored beneath ground zero. This single cache belonging to the Bank of Nova Scotia was unearthed and made public. Was there more and was it removed remains a question. As last survivor William Rodriguez climbed the stairwell to rescue people, he remembers a very strange thing. As I stood there on the 33rd floor, I heard very strange noises on the 34th floor. Now, the 34th floor was an empty floor, a floor that did not have any kind of uh, walls or it was a construction uh, uh, floor. It was totally hollowed out. There was nothing there, and I heard very heavy equipment being moved around, and it sounded like uh, dumpsters with uh, uh, metal wheels being moved around and I got scared because I knew it was an empty floor. Nobody was supposed to be there. As a matter of fact, not even the elevators stopped there. You have to have a special access key to open the door on the 34th floor. So to find that there were strange noises there and I continue actually bypassing that floor because I didn't dare to open the door on the 34th floor. Something told William Rodriguez not to mess with the 34th floor. I got scared. Yet William Rodriguez was not a man who was scared that day. He remained in a burning building against firemen's orders, endangering his own life as he saved the lives of others. What could have been happening on the 34th floor? For weeks, Scott Forbes had heard similar noises on the 98th floor above him. It must have been at least um, four to six weeks before 9-11. It, it was like rebuilding work going on upstairs. The tenants, the people from Aeon who had been there were moved somewhere else. The offices were just vacant. And there was a lot of heavy machinery building work going on. It was almost like pneumatic drills and lots of hammering, so much so that the floors were shaking. That's how noticeable it was. It was almost as if uh, something heavy was being moved and then it was being taken off wheels and it was like boom. Our floor underneath literally shook. You could feel the weight above you. That was how large it was. On one occasion, I opened the door to see what was going on being nosy. When I opened the door, the whole office space was empty. There was nothing there at all. It was quite bizarre because it was just empty. Completely empty, barren, nothing. Zero. Not even cable tangling from the ceiling, but there'd been these heavy noises and vibrations up above. It was really strange. And the noticeable dust in the building the week before. It was probably the week leading up to 9-11. Every morning I'd come in around 7 a.m. and the dust was incredible. It was filthy. It was like the cleaners weren't cleaning. Right where the windows were, there was a sill which enclosed radiators. I was sick to death of the dust which was appearing on the window sills. It was um, dirty gray and very, very noticeable in that week leading up to 9-11. Where was that dust coming from? 
gray dust Scott himself had to clean. Was it powdered cement? The steel columns of the Twin Towers formed an endo and exoskeleton. Had something been placed around the edge of the building, holes been drilled to contain it? Was the dust in those final days a telltale sign? As white elephants, the buildings were full of vacant offices. Tenants could be temporarily moved around for upgrades as Aeon was, and a plan arranged to perfection. Was the strange construction that could be heard but not seen going on all over the towers? Larry Silverstein took possession six weeks before September 11th, when the strange construction began. already led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. This interpretation of 9-11 would lead people who take their religion's moral principles seriously to support a movement to change U.S. foreign policy. An even stronger reaction would be evoked by the third interpretation, for it entails that the Bush administration allowed thousands of its own citizens to be killed on 9-11, deliberately and cold-bloodedly, for the sake of advancing its imperial interests. Deny the domestic violence as being a, a serious disorder in our midst. We discovered major indications that the Twin Towers were brought down by a sophisticated kind of controlled demolition. Jim, do you believe that the United States is an enemy of justice and uh, peace, as suggested there? The government's story isn't even physically possible. It violates laws of physics and laws of engineering. The day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld reported to Congress that the Pentagon lost track of $2.3 trillion. Larry Silverstein had insured the World Trade Center for $3.5 billion. American people deserve to know the truth about what happened to their nation on 9-11. The molten metal pools under both towers after they collapsed and Building 7. Now, Building 7 wasn't even hit by a, a jet. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees, bright, bright, reddish, orange color. Molten metal is my first topic. It's the one that really caught my interest, and, and the data is just coming together. Now, I have a sample of this molten metal, and uh, by analyzing this, we determined it is not molten aluminum from the plane. Okay. Uh, indeed, it contains a great deal of iron, uh, which is the product of the thermite reaction. Sulfur added to this molten iron, and it'll just cut through steel, through structural steel, for example, like a knife through butter. On the left is building seven, and on the right is the demolition of a building in Oslo. Which this peat, of bringing a building straight down onto its own footprint requires such skill that only a handful of demolition com companies in the world will attempt it. The NIST actually uh, contracted with underwriter laboratories to build uh, models and it subject them to severe fire tests. What happened? It didn't fail. The building wouldn't even start to collapse according to the fire test. Those are actual experiments. I, I like. That was a good thing to do, but the buildings didn't collapse, you see. Remember, all they had to find was a software model because the real model didn't fail. Favorable assumptions for achieving a fast fall, including ignoring resistance due to intact steel columns. You still could only get the uh, building to fall in about 8.3 seconds, whereas the observed roofed roof fall time is the corner of the roof that he's looking at, 6.5 seconds. So his point is that something had to move these floors below out of the way so that this building could fall that fast. So molten metal in the basements of all three buildings. Right. And yet uh, all scientists now uh, reasonably uh, agree that the fires were not sufficiently hot to melt the steel. So what is this molten metal? It's a direct evidence for the use of a high temperature explosive such as thermite 
thermite produces uh, molten iron as, a, as an end product. The official investigation, blessed by FEMA, is a half-baked farce. Well, what the heck, just put a few random fires in there, maybe some damage, and, and you saw the towers, they just fall straight down. You see? I, I mean, it's not like I'm alone in this. This is not crazy to challenge the official story. Okay, we're back again, and we have time for maybe one call before we go off. If we have a, if we, well, when we have a call, just put it right straight through. In the meantime, um, I hope I've given enough information for that mechanical engineer who I spoke to, to uh, do some further investigations. Um, I also have pamphlets. I ordered up over a hundred pamphlets from architects and engineers for 911truth.org. That's AE911truth.org. And uh, I'll be giving out those to everybody I meet, sending them to architects, trying to get other architects to join Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And uh, I hear the phone ringing. Where's that coming from? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we're going to have uh, one, one more caller before we go off the air here. Uh, my next show, by the way, is going to be on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th. Uh, we're first and third Saturdays, so the fact that there's one more Saturday. Go ahead, caller. doesn't mean that we'll be on this. Yeah, Bill. The 30th. You, yeah. you know, the thing that scares me about the Obama election and all that stuff is the people that brought us 9-11 and all the carnage that we've been watching for the past eight years. They now move back into the shadow where they came from. Right. It's going to be harder to track them. Uh, they, they'll have pretty much free reign to do anything they want. Well, look, Carl Rove is already just a pundit on Fox now. He's not anybody that we're going to go after. Yeah, that, that... And, and that's the uh, that's that's a scary thing. And the other thing, too, you brought up about running into somebody that, uh, that kind of gave you the sideways look about... Uh, you know, when, oh, you're one of those yeah, guys. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the, the thing that I watched was... Uh, um, just before, uh, right around your last show at the beginning of the month, uh, History Channel, or what I call the Revisionist oh, History right. I, Channel. I absolutely despise and, their and work. What they were running was the uh, the NIST uh, 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 story. And the, my, my theory on that is too many people watch that, not enough people are watching the, the what you just played, the 9-11 Mysteries, uh, Stephen uh, Jones, uh, uh, the other people, David Ray Griffin. Um, not enough people are getting the other side. All they get is the History Channel, the Fox News Channel, and uh, the, the story from the people that go back into the shadows. Bill, you're doing a great job. Thanks a bunch. Thanks a lot. Bye. And we got one more call. Hey, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hey, um, I'd like to get to send you a book if I can. Uh, it's an information book written locally by someone, and it'll give you some more explanations on... Uh, a few things you might be very interested in. Well, uh, you could either send it to, you know, PCM Studios with, you know, in care of Bill Olson. Okay. Or at the end of the video here, we'll, I mean, the show will have my email, and you can contact me, and we'll get together somehow. Okay, I'd like to do that. And, uh, uh, yeah, because it's very informative. It's a good book. Well, and I'm always interested in books. I love I love a, a big library. Everybody should have one. And I even started doing video stuff too. And you know, the people that say, "How come we don't have more people telling about 9/11?" and "How come we don't have whistleblowers and stuff?" Well, we actually do. It's just that their you know their publicity is severely lacking. <laughs> Well, yeah, when we have a media that's suppressed by the federal government, there's not yeah. much we can do about that. Uh, hey, the book's called Martial Law Rule by Robert Rangrud out of uh, Oh, okay, I've heard of that one, too. And, of course, I've, you're familiar with the Alex Jones Martial Law's videos, right? Oh, yeah. Well, Alex is a little bit off yeah. base. Yeah, well, Robert... he's, he's a sensationalist a lot. That's his Martial Law video. <laughs> but, anyway, oops, I said it on the microphone. Sorry about that audio guy. Hey, I got well, one more call I, that I got to go to before we get off the air here. 
I would like to get your email, so don't hang up on me. Let me have somebody else to... Well, it's that. right on the end. It's 251omega at comcast.net, and it's right on the end credits at the same time, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And next caller. I'm sorry to be so quick on this, but we just have about two minutes left. Three minutes. Hello, caller. Yes, sir. Ah. Well, is this... Yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about your theory about the towers falling. Yeah. Uh, you know, the jet fuel is really a hot fuel. When it, when it can't it burn any hotter than 1,800 degrees, and that steel was certified to 2,000 degrees for six hours. It only burned 45 minutes. you got to come up with another explanation. Besides which... That black smoke told us that it didn't reach its maximum temperature, no matter what it was. Well, I tell you what, I'm a Vietnam vet, and I know how hot jet fuel gets. Right. And when those uh, when those jets hit the buildings, you know, you got to realize that that, that fuel's going to burn for a while. Yeah, but any jet and fuel. And the weight the weight of the uh, top of the buildings after the fuel burns through the structure of that building is going to topple that. Tower, well, no matter how you need to, no. You're wrong. You need to take another look at the tower, and you'll see that most of that fuel was blown up outside the tower, and that for almost 20 minutes there was no fire in that building at all, and then it collapsed. The firemen had well, gotten to, what, the was, firemen uh, had gotten to the 78th floor, and they said there's only two small fires that we can put out, and then it collapsed right then. That's why that the one that was hit second fell first because the firemen were about to blow the cover story by putting out the fires. That means that they killed those firemen by deliberately bringing that building down first. As it, That's just another example of their plan getting screwed up. They botched their 9-11 plan so badly that there are so many things that we find out about it that they didn't mean to happen. And that's one of them. They brought those buildings down to murder those firemen because they were about to stop the fires that were the cover story for the collapse. Now, well, I'll tell you you're what, wrong, you know, sir. Cut the guy it. off. Cut him off. I'm, I'm done. I don't want to talk to people like that. I'm, t I'm trying to give you information that you can use to find out exactly what is wrong with your opinion. And if you're going to tell me that that fire caused it, you're going against science. You're going against the facts. You're going against physical properties of, that you can't violate. You can't hurt that steel with less than... 2,000 degrees. That's the fact. So how did that steel get segmented into 24 or 30 foot lengths? Well, we got 30 seconds left. We're rolling it up. There's my email. Contact me if you'd like to get a listing of my Google. I have all these shows on Google. They're viewed worldwide now. I've, in almost every country of the world. Well, not that's exaggeration. About half the countries. So email me and I'll send you a directory of 23 shows that I got on Google. And uh, there's so much information out there, we need to make sure that people like that last caller, who's obviously in severe denial, gets facts that they can find a little niche to start investigating. Once you find out, you'll never view it the same way again. And thanks for watching. See you next time on Pearl Harbor Day.